All right. So basically, just want to reiterate a little bit of what we talked about on Friday, last class, but also just talk about a few other things when working with this oil clay. So the assignment is you have to make at least one um, or you have to make two different pieces, one abstract, one representational. We'll get into that again. And of course, please do ask if anybody has questions. But I want to talk about this clay. So everybody got a brick of this la or la bouche touch, the fancy touch of uh, high melt past plastiline from Chavant clay. So what this is, is it's an oil-based clay. If you've ever done any ceramic work or anything like that, that is a water-based clay. It has a lot of the same properties, but the main binding agent instead of water is oil. And what oil, I don't recall, I don't recall it, it doesn't really matter. Main thing is this stuff will not dry out. Um, it stays pretty much the same consistency throughout its life. It will pick up little bits of schmutz, you know, so like, you know, drop it on the floor, dusk, roll around, anything like that. Yeah, of course it's gonna pick it up. Um, but basically it stays the same consistency unaltered. And what I mean by that is, whereas normal water-based clay will harden over time, as in like, as it dries out, it'll shrink and it'll get harder, which can work to your advantage. You're working with a surface, you let it dry a little bit, it stiffens a little bit, and then you can smooth it, things like that. This clay will not do that. It changes, uh, it changes properties with temperature. And that could be just from you working it, just your own body heat. If you need to heat this stuff up, you can, if you have like a windowsill, uh, a sunny day, cut a few chunks up, set it by the windowsill, anything like that, but put like something down. And I'll tilt the camera down and you can see. Um, so, I put down a piece of paper. Hopefully this stays focused. Um, this oil clay, it's fine, but it is oil clay and the red in it, sorry, it's having difficulty focusing, uh, does have some, or it will stain a little bit. Uh, Kat, yes, please. You have your hand up. I feel like you mentioned this also before. So, you know, stop me if I'm repeating myself. Um, is this able to be microwaved? Yes, you can put this in the microwave. However, <laughs> so I'm going to cut this stuff up. I made a quick uh, uh, wire tool, uh, clay wire tool. If you have a ceramics wire tool, same deal. I just used some of the wire we used and wrapped, uh, wrapped it around a couple of handles. I was trying to do this before with just making a couple of uh, finger loops, but that has a tendency to slice into your hands pretty bad. So use the uh, wire tool and you can just clip a couple of parts off. Oh, why is having such trouble focusing? See if that works. I don't quite understand why. Hmm. Anyway, um, but yeah, you can take, but you wanna part it up into chunks. Uh, if you do wanna use the microwave or whatever, that's fine. Main thing being, just like microwaving like a burrito or something. It's a big dense brick. If it's a big dense brick or the whole thing, uh, it's not gonna heat evenly through and through. You're gonna end up with real hot areas and then just icy in the center sort of thing. The difference is, well, yes, similarity. You got a hot pocket, you just microwaved and you bite into it. The outside scalds everything and the inside is still frozen. So similar diff here, uh, you cut this stuff up into smaller blocks so it's easier to deal with. I guess I made my wire tool a bit oversized. There we are. Um, cut it into smaller blocks, you have more surface area, the heat can get to it more readily. Do not overheat this stuff. It will turn into just liquid napalm, which napalm is liquid, anyway. Um, it will burn the hell out of you. You will get a very severe burn if you um, let this go too long. So like, if you do microwave it, use a, don't use a metal bowl. Let me pause a second here. So yeah, uh, make sure you're using small chunks because this will heat up very easily and you can burn yourself very badly. If you look on the lab label here, it says high melt. That is exactly what it means. This stuff technically 
you could actually liquefy it and it will uh, with heat liquefy it pour it into a mold and you can get a clay duplicate out of a mold that stuff's pretty great i've yet to actually test that th that uh, that option out myself but that's supposedly an option but that also means you have liquid sticky oily stuff so think of like a bacon spatter or a grease spatter yeah only a hell of a lot worse so do not heat this up too much that's why i recommend like the windowsill or if you have like a heat lamp anything like that that's fine but like little 30 second bursts in the microwave water do it alternatively if you have a bowl of like hot water you could throw this into a bowl of just hot water and that will help remember when you're cutting this stuff apart do not use anything sharp because it's not like you're going to hurt the clay or anything you see how much force it takes just to take put a wire through it you have to put that pull against something and inevitably you're using like a razor knife or something you're probably likely to injure yourself very badly so don't use anything sharp use like a wire tool hell a butter knife if you like but don't use anything sharp uh cut up into chunks there you go so this will stain. So because the red in this, it comes from iron oxide, comes from, you know, rust. So be wary of that. All right. So those are the main safety stuffs. Put something down. You know, you can see as I'm working on the table here, it does transfer a little bit of the red. It's not terrible, but, you know, just like anything else, why wear anything? If you're working, don't wear anything you actually like, things like that. Um, and I'm just cutting this up into a few smaller chunks still. So yeah, heat it up. It'll get more pliable. That said, maybe you're working on the surface and it becomes too pliable. It's too sticky. Getting everything kind of gooey and everything. Set your part aside for a little while. Hell, put it in the micro, or, sorry, put it in the refrigerator. Let it cool off. That will allow the clay to harden back up. It softens with heat. When it loses that energy, it comes it goes back to its natural state of being fairly hard still clay though all right so first things first just want to show you some texturing tools and such texturing and sculpting now i showed everybody the tools that everybody got and the uh there to go box there now Will you use all these tools? Probably not. You're probably going to find one or two that you really like working with, and that'll be your main tools that you use. But play around with these. You're going to find different ways to use them, so some different uh, benefits to some, whatever. I often end up with just using like one or two little bits. Um, and you can certainly reshape these. These are stainless steel. Uh, if you have like a grinder or anything like that, you can sand these down to a different shape if you like to adjust the profile they all do different things but play around with it you know you're gonna have some tools that are pointy that are great for carving in or just pressing in and creating indentations or offsets anything like that but most of the times you're using it just as little point tools or you know you're trying to cut out a section so this is what I mean by their, the tools are largely interchangeable, but they're just convenient tools to use. Now, one quick thing, digging something out, do not use the thinner tools. Some of these have a much thinner neck on them. Some of these are much thicker. Use the thicker ones because as you already are starting to find out, this clay is very stiff. So, uh, you start trying to bowl out, scoop out a section, it's going to bend your tool all up and you may even break it. Not the end of the world, but just be just be forewarned. Especially when you go to do like your pierce through element with your for your abstract piece, if you're actually like pushing through, cutting through, that might become an issue. There we are. All right. Ultimately, I recommend just experimenting and playing. I showed everybody last week a little bit of things like using the same tools and you pressing, using them as press tools, but use like repeating patterns, doing the same thing, you know, repeating it over the course of a form and you start to create actual texture. You do that for a large enough area and it becomes a textured surface. So just playing around. 
Um, some of these, you know, are really great for scooping out or making different size holes, playing about. Other things, taking little elements and like rolling them into balls and just sticking all over. Now I've got some examples from previous semesters I can show everybody. And we'll go over that, but this stuff sticks to itself very readily, especially when it's warm. If you need to reshape this, let it cool, and it would be easier to then go in and do more of finer work. So we'll do specific demonstrations in a bit. Um, other things I talked to you all about a little bit about is play with things like literally play with other materials and uh, for texturing tools. You can use something like a ruler. If you want long straight slices in, this would be really great for making like bark tree like tree form, you know, like a tree bark, something like that. And I'm just literally like pressing it, this in repeatedly, altering the pressure and angle ever so slightly. And you can start to create this kind of bark-like surface, or for that matter, careful, don't chop the hell out of your hand, but just, wha just whacking at the surface. And it's not like I'm trying to chop it in half, but again, altering the angle a little bit. I don't know how well you can see this, but you can really start to get a, yeah, more bark-like surface out of something like that. Another excellent tool, brushes. Use a hairbrush, an old toothbrush. Don't use the one you're using because you will not get this crap out of there. Or like here, uh, you got a welding brush or, a, uh, or like a barbecue pit brush, steel brush does not need to be steel by any means. Just that was what I have on hand. This is an excellent tool for one, patting in. You can create excellent little uh, stipples, like dimples across a surface. You whack at it really heavily. Now this will transfer some stuff to it, to your uh, the clay to the tool. So this can start to create a really interesting, see how this focus, there we go. Really interesting stippled surface. Similar, uh, similarly, especially to like the uh, surface I got from whacking with the, uh, the ruler there. There we are. To simulate something like fur or hair, you could use the brush and instead of stippling, pull at it. Now this is gonna create a bunch of little boogers, especially with a stiffer brush like this. And frankly, depending on what you're doing, this may well actually be a better simulation of like texture and bark. Trying to get the camera to refocus here. Ah, there we go. So that can be a very useful thing. But also be aware, stroking like that, yeah, you're definitely going to get a bunch of little boogers flying everywhere. So be careful that they also don't get all stuck to your camera or computer. Um, of course, this is metal. If I need to clean this off, I could use heat and this would just all melt off of there. So that's convenient. Um, but yeah, play with different tools, play with different things. Um, here is a SOS pad, like a scrub brush pad. Let me see if I have a clean surface here. Here we are. Play with pressing different materials in. This starts to give a very strange, well, similar to tapping with the, uh, the brush there. This can start to give a very strange, uh, similar textured surface. So I'm trying to get to the focus. There we are. If you're trying to simulate um, skin texture, the uh, cells and pores on skin itself, 
that can be a combination and that often is a combination of using something like a wire brush and patting ever so lightly to simulate the pores and then just going back and kind of smoothing those back over. Those can be a really convenient way to create a surface or a skin surface and play around, you know, add different materials, add different textures. Skin has wrinkles and stretches in different ways. Stuff to that effect. It's very subtle, but more of a combination of the two. Can't really see much of anything on that. Um, but there's such a variety of other things. Uh, I talked about using aluminum foil. Again, I don't have any aluminum foil here, uh, but a similar texture can be gotten from like just using crinkled paper. Aluminum foil is a lot more, or a lot easier to use or a lot more effective just because it's, it's harder. But crinkled paper, what you're doing is randomizing a surface and then using that and using that to then press in you're getting all of those little folds and crinkles of the paper. And you start to get this really strange like crinkled surface here. Doesn't translate very well here. So aluminum foil is far more effective. Clean up some of these clay balls. All right, so next I want to talk about is an armature. Now, armatures are, ouch, carefully don't stab yourself. Armatures are, if you're working with clay, whatever type, and you need to add some structure inside, especially those if you're like making longer, thinner sections like this, and much longer than that. Obviously, it's just kind of a glop or whatever. But you start do, working with this, it starts warming up, anything like that, it's going to droop, it's going to break apart, anything like that. An armature can be something as simple as a single piece of wire merged inside of your clay. You could stick it up through, you could press this in and allow the clay itself to wrap around the wire and encompass it can also be a convenient way of working if you are making features. So I've got like this kind of odd, like horn hair kind of thing going. And I wanted to add this feature to a larger form I'm working on. I could have a bit of, bit of wire sticking out the end and use that as a perfect way to jam on there. And attach your form and attach different pieces. So I could have a main body and some little, a bunch of little components. So let's say, like, I don't know, we little fins of some sort. I'll put a little bit of, I'll put a little wire in there. Be careful because, like with the wire project, Using clippers, you make a very sharp point on that on that wire. So, so you got like little fins and such. Now I could add these very easily to my design. So this is an excellent way of adding elements or features that you're maybe not sh exactly sure where you want them to go yet, or if they have a very small connection point, this is an excellent way to add a little bit of strength into that small connection point. The wire's just in there, just squashes on, you're all good. Don't forget it's there if you're sculpting additional parts, but very handy to use. Other thing could be, maybe it's for display. Maybe your finished piece, you make some sort of a simple stand and this is just wrapping some wire around. And for display purposes, and it's a fairly top heavy here, of course, but now I've got a little stand for my rabbit block monster thing. Whatever. So wire is very useful. The other option is 
on the heels of, I'm sorry, losing focus here. I don't know why. On the heels of asking, well, how big do these need to be? Well, one of the issues with scaling up a solid brick of clay idea is you can see how difficult it can be to just start moving around this smaller amount. Now, yes, you could microwave it again. Yes, you could heat it up in your hand. You could use a hot bowl of water and dunk this in, whatever. A larger object is going to be more difficult to work with because it's so much, it's so much of the single block of clay. Same thing goes, it can also be a big consumer of clay. There's no reason to have something that's you know that big around, like a big potato, don't make a potato of uh, solid clay. Well, armature can also be used, or the term armature is, can also be used for space saving material. What I mean by that is not space going, your fine NASA grade metals and such, but I mean, taking, so this is just paper, aluminum foil works well also. Reason I say aluminum foil works well is because you can rough out a shape quickly by crunching up aluminum foil, but then you can skin it with your clay. And yes, it encapsulates your form. You've got, in this case, now I've got a chunk of, of uh, paper in there, but you can very easily start to build up a much more massive ob object, something with a lot more volume without using solid clay, without one using up a whole bunch of your material, but also it doesn't need to be a solid brick of clay. There's no need for that. This now is easier to move. So if I, as I'm sculpting, if I want, want to adjust this slightly, because it's not solid inside, it gives a little more effectively. Now, yes, of course, it's a little more pliable because I've been working with it. It's now a little bit warmer, that sort. But using armatures as both an internal surface or an internal space saver, or using wire or something as a way to add to your shape, add to your form, that can really help out. Really helpful ways of working. Would it make sense to make an entire thing out of wire and then put clay over it? Sure. If you were making something stick figurey. This is very, this really helps out in making like just general forms if you are unsure of what you really want it to be like. There we are, I can make like a little, exactly that, like some kind of like little simple stick figure kind of thing going. All right, very haphazard, well, sort of kind of person-y kind of thing, or maybe a little gray man, don't know. <laughs> Um, but from this, you could then start to add clay on top of that. Makes it a little bit easier to work with sometimes when you can rough out your form in wire and then start building clay on top of it. So one, you can get much thinner with your clay. Like I said, it'll hold up better across longer spans, but also you just have a better reference of what you're doing. And this clay can just warp right around it. Is it recoverable? Yeah, of course. You can always peel this clay right back off. That's the whole point of it being oil-based. It does not dry out. You can just keep building on top. Now, one thing you may have noticed me doing is as I glob clay on, I'm smoothing it over with my thumb or fingers. What that does is obviously one, it's smoothing the form, it's smoothing the surface itself, but you're also blending the clay together. That's gonna to help to, again, homogenize the surface, make it actually what you want it to be, and that's smooth, craggly, whatever, but it's going to squash the clay into the neck, into what it's on already. So in other words, squash the clay together. They're gonna to blend more effectively. It's gonna bond more effectively. So squashing and smoothing the clay over isn't just a technique for shaping the surface, it's really for actually bonding the clay together. Like I said, this is not water-based clay. It does not change properties with, on its own or with the addition or subtraction of moisture. It does so with heat. So the more you work at it, 
it will get warmer, it will get softer, it will get more sticky. If you are trying to do a lot of shaping, it needs to be warmed up. If that means you do it with like a microwave or something, great. You just do it by hand, fine, whatever you like. But with that armature inside, now I can also start to play around with, oh, you know what? I kind of want to pose this a little bit differently. Now, this is not a great armature. I you know, just kind of threw it together. But this could start to work really well for creating shape. Maybe I'll turn it this way and kind of turn it into some kind of like dinosaur little thingy. Doesn't really matter. But an armature just refers to some sort of structure inside of clay, be it wire, be it paper, aluminum foil, whatever you like. So play around. Just remember the stuff will stain a little bit. Be very careful of if you have arm, uh, wire armatures, cutting that leaves very sharp points and you'll apparently stab yourself. Whoops. Um, and it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of something on the table to keep uh, red oil clay from streaking onto everything. So those are pretty much the basics of working with this clay. We're gonna continue to work with this as we go throughout the project, but I encourage you to play around with it. And just remember you're making two separate pieces. One is abstract, one is representational. We'll talk about more.